Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, today I'm going to talk about one of the least understood pieces of test gear that you can own. It's the Humble Logic Analyzer. Now, I don't think there's any bit of basic test gear that is more feared or misunderstood than the Logic Analyzer. People just don't really understand them or they're scared of them or they don't know how to use them properly. The first thing is, do you actually need a Logic Analyzer? And for most developers, the answer is not really. Now, generally speaking, most designs can be debugged with an oscilloscope these days. And it's even more the case these days now that oscilloscopes have very deep memories on them. So you can capture tons of data, serial or, uh, well, usually only serial because an oscilloscope's only a couple of channels. That's the main disadvantage. Uh, and the main advantage of the logic analyzer is that they're multiple channels. But the large... Uh, sample memories in oscilloscopes mean that um, a lot of the time a, a lot of traditional uses for these logic analyzers like debugging serial product protocols like SPI or I2C or RS-232 uh, are, are done by the oscilloscope these days. Logic analyzers uh, come in three main types that you need to consider. One is the traditional bench instrument. Uh, you can still buy them. They're you know as big or bigger than a bench oscilloscope. And, and they cost, you know, $5,000, $10,000, $50,000, dollars They can be very expensive. Uh, and they take up a lot of bench space. And unless you have a very specific need for them, they, they're pretty much a waste of space on your bench. Uh, the second one is probably the most useful, and that is a combi scope, which is a combined uh, oscilloscope and logic analyzer. Like uh, all the major manufacturers make them, you'll have your traditional two or four channel oscilloscope, and it'll have a eight or sixteen channel logic analyzer built in usually. And they're really useful because you can actually uh, trigger easily trigger off say your analog uh, channels, and then capture the data, your digital data, at the same time. So there, I find they're the most useful type, but they can add a lot of price to your oscilloscope. So generally they're not as good value for money as getting the third type, which is a PC-based oscilloscope. Uh, the market's flooded with these things these days. Uh, you can get them uh, anywhere from you know, $50, $100 up to I don't know, several thousand dollars, something like that. But your general mid-range ones are about you know, a couple hundred dollars and they're the most useful type, I think. They don't take up any room at all. This is quite a large one, actually. But they generally don't take up much room and they're cheap and they're available for when you, they can just pull them out of the drawer when you actually need it. So I'd recommend you get one of these USB uh, logic analyzers. There's a couple of reasons why logic analyzers aren't that popular. And the first reason is that they, well, they're just fiddly to use. You've got all these channels you've got to hook up, right? You've got to hook all these things up, probe them on. You've got to make sure that, they've, that they're making good contact. And then you've got to label each channel in your software so that you don't interpret the wrong one. Trust me, if you're going to go to the effort of wiring up more than one or two channels, do yourself a real favour and label Go, take, the, take a few minutes to label each channel in the software. The next major problem with logic analyzers is that what you see on the screen is not necessarily what is actually happening in your circuit. These things have so many traps. For young players, it's not funny. Even for experienced people, you can get tricked into thinking that uh, your circuit's doing something that it's actually not, or not doing something that it should, or whatever. Now the reason for that is that logic analyzers, what you see on the screen, this representation, you see your waveforms 1010, that's not necessarily what's happening actually in your circuit. What that represents is what the internal latch chip thinks your circuit is doing at the exact point that it samples that clock. Now your input waveform, it can be noisy, it can be all over the place, it can be overshooting, undershooting doing all sorts of things and there's going to be a logic uh, low threshold and a logic high threshold at that point. And that uh, has to do, uh, your probes can affect that and all sorts of things. So it's really not as good as an oscilloscope because an oscilloscope actually shows you what's there, as long as you probe it correctly of course. 
But really, you're working a bit blind with a logic analyzer. You've got to even you've got to basically trust it, and that's one of their major pitfalls. Now you can actually get uh, some logic analyzers that do work like an oscilloscope. They're basically a crude uh, oscilloscope, so you can actually see the wave shape as well, just like on a so it's like a you know a 32 channel oscilloscope basically. But uh, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. Now, when it comes to how logic analyzers work, there's two modes of operation, and here they are. The first one's called timing analysis mode. The second is called state analysis mode. And the difference between these two is basically that um, timing analysis mode, it works like your oscilloscope. It's got an internal clock, and it basically takes fast samples, and you can see your input waveform or waveforms change with time just like a basically it's a binary oscilloscope if you want to think of it like that but in state analysis mode it doesn't use an internal clock you have to provide it with an external clock your own clock that is generally uh, in uh, that is synchronous to the data that you're actually trying to analyze that's why the state analysis is synchronous and timing analysis is asynchronous. Now, for most purposes, you're going to want to use timing analysis mode uh, because that is more useful unless you have a specific need to analyze uh, your system and to do system analysis of actually what's happening within your system on a given clock edge or something like that, a specific state in your system, you're really not going to want to touch state analysis much. If you're going to need it, you're going to know it. And because of various uh, factors to do with um, the, the design of the capture system in the logic analyzer and various other things, generally the spec, the sample rate for state analysis for any given logic analyzer is going to be less than timing analysis. That's just the way it is. There's another thing you've got to consider when you're buying a logic analyzer, and that's sample memory. Now, just like an oscilloscope, you need to get the biggest, deepest sample memory you can get. It's very important on a logic analyzer because usually you're analyzing data and lots of it. So you need a big sample memory. But to confuse the issue, there are two different types of sample memory. Well, the same sample memory, but two different types of systems. And here they are. The first one is sequential sampling. It's, that's not really its name. It's just normal, the traditional method. That's how almost every, most logic analyzers uh, will work, okay? And the other is compression sampling. That's really cool. What that means is that it actually compresses the data before it stores it in memory. And here's how they work. Here's the differences. Now, in the sequential sampling system, if this is your sample clock, and this is the input data you're sampling, it doesn't matter what the input data's doing. You're going to use the same amount of memory. Your data can be sitting there at all zeros, and it's going to be chewing up precious memory. <clears throat> Because you've got a sample at each interval like this, and each one of those is using one, two, three, four. It's using up a byte or a word of your memory at each one of those samples, and right up to a thousand and so on. And this, uh, this isn't very good if you're trying to measure, say, a packet of I squared C data here, and then another packet of data which is way down there. That means you've got to have a huge, massive, many megabytes of sample memory, um, otherwise you're not going to be ca able to capture all these widely spaced um, packets of data that you want to analyze. This is where compression sampling comes in. Now compression sampling is, will only, it, it still samples at the same rate as this one, okay, but it will only store data, it will only use a, a word or a byte of memory whenever one of the input data channels changes. So in this example here, it's only used one, two, three, four words of memory because the data's only changed, it's only transitioned four times. Whereas up here, the same waveform might take, say, a thousand or even more, a million bytes of memory to capture just that same couple of little things. 